I was not allowed to introduce one piece of evidence, not even one shred of evidence. And um, uh, I was going to take the witness stand. And this is kind of stretches the story too long, but my situation became so intenuous with my, uh, with my um, uh, attorney that I got up and I tried to invoke my right to represent myself because he was, he was throwing the case and he wouldn't ask the proper questions and you know that's another long story but my, the judge denied me the right to represent myself in court. I explained why. Um, I said he's not asking obvious questions that need to be asked and that's on the record and the judge denied me the right to represent myself. So I was found guilty obviously. And um, uh, again, the, the, the jury was hearing tons of evidence that pertained to my ex, some that pertained to me, which was collecting the money. And the, the, the uh, prosecutor made it sound like I was involved from day one. Why? Because I was his wife. And um, so I received 24 years based on not really what I did, but the way that the federal uh, drug cases are structured is that if you do one little thing, one little ancillary thing, you're guilty for uh, the entire weight of all the drugs involved in the conspiracy. They estimated that my husband had manufactured um, 3 million plus tablets of ecstasy. And then they use a chart and the judge has, his hands are tied. The judge is not, uh, was not somebody that was compassionate to me, but even he said at sentencing that um, I had found myself in a situation where um, um, Congress had decided to tie his hands and he had no other choice but to sentence me based on um, these, these parameters where he just has to follow a chart. And um, that put me, the government wanted me sentenced at a level 42, which the chart only goes to a 43, which is life. And even the judge departed from what the government uh, was asking for me and gave me 24 years instead of, I don't know, they wanted, I think, 38 years. And, and then I got a $10,000 fine. So. So I got 24 years and um, based on the amount of ecstasy that Sandy had manufactured. In the meantime, he had decided to cooperate. And he um, not only threw me under the bus and said that I had collected the money for him, um, he snitched all the people in his organization out. And um, I guess one thing that they're told is when you debrief, if you leave out one thing, they don't have to honor a plea agreement. So the person has an incentive that you better tell every single detail. But you do have that opportunity at that moment to, I think, negotiate and say, you know, um, as part of my plea agreement, I, I, I would prefer that you leave my wife alone or whatever. I don't even think he asked for that because it was very clear by that time that I was seeing somebody else. I was dating someone else. In fact, the federal agents even showed him pictures of somebody that I was dating by that time, and uh, even though I tried to help him. But enough on that story. I go to Dublin, California, and um, that's when it all hit me. That's when I really felt like the elephant on my chest. And I'll never forget, because I was so strong in Waco. Um, hmm, I would call home and you know, I'd always tell my mom and dad that, that we just have to have faith and everything's gonna be okay. And, hmm. They're very religious people, they're Catholic, and it seemed like they, they wanted me to cooperate too. And when I was in Waco, and I just said, I just can't. And so, you know, I'd kind of read passages out of the Bible at times about, you know, to have faith. And I really believed, I really believed somehow a miracle would happen. And, so I got to Dublin, and I'll never forget the first phone call that I made home. 
my parents more than anything didn't deserve to go through this and what they went through. Do you need to take a minute? I, you know, I think I'm fine. It'll be okay. It's so funny. You think you're over all this and it just comes rushing right back. Yeah. Oh. Um, my mother and I made an agreement that we would not communicate when I was in prison. That was smart. You know, she knew where I was going. I wrote her a a yeah. couple of those letters that you perhaps should save for an in-person <laughs> conversation. Yeah. She didn't want my grandparents to find out. Yeah. Or to actually pick up a phone. We have a call from an yeah. inmate at I the know. East Moline Correctional Center. Uh, I called home and um, hmm. I just remember it's like I, I kind of broke that point, you know. And they were kind of used to always hearing from me and I would be upbeat and I would be like, you know, the strong one. And um, I remember I started, I started kind of freaking out. I was sort of crying. And, and I remember, I don't know if it was my mom or my dad, but they said, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I just kind of screamed in the phone. I said, I'm in prison, you know. And it was so different um, in Dublin because there's these double fences. And if people want to talk about club fed and that inmates have it so nice and I'm so sick of, of uh, reading those emails about how, um, oh, one way to deal with uh, uh, health care is just go rob a bank and go to a federal prison and you'll have all your cares taken care of, you know. And, um, once you get there, it's, uh, you really have that come to Jesus moment where you go to your knees because the razor wire and the permanency of it is, really sets in. And um, it's not club fed, and it's not pretty. And um, there's a parameter truck that drives around like a shark all the time. And you really, uh, psychologically, you know, you don't know whether you're ever going to get out. And then, then it gets, it's like it's hard to breathe because I can only equate it to having, an, you know, an elephant on my chest. And, and it's crushing, 